Let's pray again, shall we? Father God, we, we only want to hear your word, Lord. Take, Lord, your unworthy servant and make something of this morning, Lord, that will be a blessing to us, Lord. We understand we can do nothing except by the enabling of your Holy Spirit, Lord. So we surrender all our talents, whatever they may be, Lord, and ask you to take over and have your way and do your will in this place this morning. We thank you for the time we've had so far, Lord. Thank you for being able to sing your praises. Now, Lord, we trust your presence with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Jesus said this, you know, these scriptures, this scripture so well. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations... We've had a few, a few nations this morning, haven't we? I thought you did very well in Welsh, by the way. <laughs> the thing is, none of us know whether they were right or wrong, including the others as well. But it was good, it was good to hear it. Go, therefore... Now, that word go, by the way, is not as we interpret it. It's as you go. Understand? It's not simply applied to missionaries. It's as you go into the world make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now when Jesus, a Jew, said go and make disciples, he spoke to Jews who understood what that term meant. Senior rabbis of the day would have their disciples. They would have those who followed them. Wherever they went, they followed them. They learned from them. And if a rabbi agreed to take on a disciple, it would be on the basis that that disciple would totally submit to the rabbi, to the interpretation of the word of God and the scriptures as they were then. And each disciple was willing and anxious to follow the rabbi. And real life questions would arise. Actually, this happened in Wesley's day, those of you who read any church history. They used to meet and they used to wrestle with the word of God. They, they used to ask each other's questions. What, what's happened this week? Where have you succeeded this week? Where have you failed this week? What do the scriptures mean in relation to this? And this was the case. Um, for example, no work had to be done on the Sabbath. Now what did that mean? And uh, the disciples would question the rabbi. Uh, can I light a candle on the Sabbath? And if so, how many candles can I light on the Sabbath? Um, I want to divorce my wife. I'm not talking. I want to divorce my wife. On what grounds can I divorce her? In other words, they were discussing the word of God. They were talking about it. We need to do this, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, it's not fashionable, but we need to talk of these things. So the rabbi would authoritatively address practical questions so that the disciples weren't simply believing something, they were putting it into operation. <clears throat> now this wasn't necessarily a good thing, of course, for the Pharisees, because we know that they were a legalistic bunch, and the order of the day was to, uh, to behave scrupulously well, rather than things that came from the heart. Now, unlike many of our so-called discipleship programs today and books that are written, there were no agendas, there was no curriculum, it was not a course you went on, all right? You might now think what I think of some of the discipleship courses. It wasn't a course you went on. You didn't go to a, to a conference and learn discipleship. It was a continual, daily, living relationship where the rabbi would ask student, uh, questions of the students and vice versa. 
there was a discipline about it. So the rabbi might say to his disciple, why did you do that? Or, or why didn't you do that? So it wasn't a matter simply of imparting information. It was that, that there might be a discerning and a, and a growing. So I want to suggest that's, that puts into perspective for me the kind of uh, notions of three principles of prayer you know, and four principles of prosperity. These are, these, are, these are the way we talk these days. But they were not talking about these things. They were talking about the word of God and the conduct. Because the word believe, and this is where we have to be very careful when we preach the gospel, the word believe in those days was a verb. When I was at school, we were told that a verb was a doing word. Did anyone hear that when they were at school? It was a, it was a verb, all right? To believe was a verb. It was to do something. It was to act. It wasn't simply to agree a list of beliefs or a list of doctrines. It wasn't just a faith proposition. It was this willingness to submit and and follow the rabbi in every particular. So that if you were a disciple of Gamaliel, you remember uh, Gamaliel, the great famous teacher, you did as he said, you listened to what he had to say, and you surrendered your life to him. So the question arises, what is a disciple of Jesus Christ in the light of all that? Well, some might say, well, I go to church... I sing, I pray. Well, there are endless people this morning that are going to church and singing and praying, but they're not the disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, you might say, well, I believe Jesus died and rose again. I believe he performed miracles. I believe he's alive now. Well, that doesn't make you a disciple either. Even the devil believes that. Even the demons believe that and you might say, well, I've, I've said the sinner's prayer. I put my hand up in a meeting. I came forward. Well, that's wonderful, but that doesn't guarantee that you are a disciple because it's not just believing something. It's having the life of God in Jesus Christ imparted to us. They heard Jesus speaking about forgiveness, for example, and they saw him forgive. At that great time on the cross, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. They saw him rely implicitly on his Father. Now I wonder if you would just turn to the Scriptures for a moment. <clears throat> At Luke chapter 14. I've got something fairly solemn to say this morning. Don't look sad. I'm beginning to ask more and more questions about the gospel that has been preached today. And uh, we'll just have a look a little verse by verse. But Jesus left the house of one of the chief Pharisees and as he walks from the house, he turns to the crowd and he challenges, challenges them with, I think, some of the most remarkable and solemn words that Jesus ever spoke. You see, there were all sorts of people there. There were those who hung on his every word. Some enjoyed the miracles that he did. Now, you know, I go on about chapter divisions and verses. They're not very helpful at times. But if you read the end of John, John's Gospel, chapter 2, it says this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the signs and miracles, but Jesus did not believe them. He did not commit himself to them. And chapter 3 of John starts with the word but, although it's not in your Bible. But there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He wasn't there simply for the ride. He wanted to know how Jesus ticked. He wanted to get hold of him at a time when the crowds had abated and he wanted to find about him. There were people that followed him because of his miracles. Some wanted them to provide him with bread. We heard it from Jello, was it last week or, or whenever it was? You remember? He says, Jesus said to them, I say to you, you seek me because you ate the loaves 
and the bread and were filled. All manner of people followed Jesus for all sorts of reasons. But Jesus is about to battle a hasty profession. That's what he's going to do. Now what he says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. John, if you want a, if you want a title for my talk this morning, it's you cannot be a disciple, all right? He says it three times. Let me read it again. It's a solemn word. Now, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Yes, you're right. Verse 25, I didn't give the verse. Now the multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now suppose I said that. Suppose I said that this morning, you would absolutely be appalled and someone would make a rugby tackle on me and get me out of this pulpit. Suppose some great preacher said that, some great teacher, some famous person. It's, it's audacious beyond words. But who is saying it? God, the Son, is saying this. And what's, I want you to imagine he's standing here this morning and asking you this question and asking me this question. Why are you following me? Why does Jesus seem to be making discipleship so difficult? Why does he seem to be saying there are those who follow him that aren't true disciples at all? Why is it that he seems to almost be trying to repel them? Well, here's the truth. If men and women are to be one to Jesus Christ, it must be on the basis of truth. It must be on the basis of truth and nothing less than that. True love is honest love. Now says Jesus, you must come to me without one reservation. Every other relationship, this is hyperbole, this is exaggeration in a way about hating. We'll come on to that in a moment. You must come to me and your relationship with me must surpass any other relationship. Hmm. How many times do we tell people that when we're preaching the gospel? The relationship with me, says Jesus, must surpass the relationship with your mother and your father and your son and your daughter and your husband and your life and your wife. I must have first place in your life. And whenever there's a conflict between the two, I must be the priority. Whew. Have you heard this lately? Have you heard it? We give people the sinner's prayer and give them a few Bible verses. But this is what Jesus says. Even our own lives must not be a priority. What will a man give for his life? You know the Bible. All that a man has he will give for his life, Satan said to God. And Jesus said, what shall a man give in exchange for his life? We must be prepared to give up our own lives. If we want to be a disciple. Otherwise, says Jesus, you can't be my disciple. Jesus knew that there would be rivals for supremacy in our lives. Over the throne of our hearts. Now he uses the word hate and I've already said this is kind of hyperbole. It's exaggeration. Listen to this statement from him when it seemed to be a summary of his teaching on the earth. Did Jesus ever teach hate? No. He taught love. And he said this, he seemed to sum up all the law and the prophets, all that the teaching of the scriptures has uh, down to love. He says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love 
the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 5, 44. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So Jesus never taught hate, but he's talking here in relation to priority. Jesus Christ must come before my wife. Jesus Christ must come before my son and my daughters and my grandchildren. He must have first place. Not my words, but his words. It gets worse or better. Read on. <clears throat> and whoever does not, verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. How about that? Now, people knew what it meant to bear the cross. They knew that if you were carrying a cross, you were on your way to death. Before they hung a cross on you, the Romans, or before they nailed you to a cross, they hung a cross on you. They knew that anyone carrying a cross, normally anyway, would be going to death. It was, it was a one-way street. They'd watched men... Uh, crucified on crosses. They knew the horror of picking up a cross in that cruel Roman world. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his cross, notice, not my cross, no one can bear his cross. No one can bear the cross of Jesus Christ. Only he could do that. But it, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There has to be a death to selfishness. There has to be a death to sin. There has to be a death to ourselves. Look, I'm not saying we don't fail sometimes. Yes, we do. And there is forgiveness. And God has spoken about it this morning already. I'm not saying that. But there is within us that desire to live holy, to live righteously, to live a repentant life. Isn't that? If there isn't, there is no salvation at all. What a sobering warning about getting people to make a hasty decision. Love Jesus more than earthly family. Take up your cross and follow him. Be willing to lay down your life. He doesn't want false recruits. You know what I find? I find people that have come with an incomplete, emaciated gospel are harder to reach than anyone they are they have been lulled into a false sense of security they have said a sinner's prayer it may be genuine it may not be they have said a few words they have believed a few facts and they have been persuaded that they are disciples self-sacrifice supreme love for himself over family and acceptance of the cross and then he gives an illustration he talks about a rash builder and a rash soldier. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish or what king going to war, uh, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Now, Sheer and I have had a number of houses over the years and apart from this one we've extended every one we've built up we've built on whatever 
I'm sure some of you have built things or had things built. And there's a process. You get an architect or a planner and you, you go through it and you, you work it all out and you make sure you've got enough money in the bank to finish the job. Otherwise, you'd be rather foolish, wouldn't you? And this is what Jesus is saying. Count the cost. There is a cost to becoming a Christian. Now we're talking about the builder of our lives. We're talking about the building up of our lives, the building up of our characters, the building of our faith in Jesus Christ, the building of our trust, the laying of foundations. Count the cost. Count the cost. The stones are going one on another as we build, as God builds this character. Add to your faith courage and courage, knowledge, temperance, and so on. There's a progression. There's an ongoing progression, but there's a cost. And woe betide us if we say to people, there is no cost. There is a cost to becoming a Christian. I'll, in case some of you are saying, well, I thought it was free. Yes, it is. There's a, there's a glory to that. Now, Jesus goes further and, and talks about the king going to war. One side, 10,000 men. On the other, 20,000. Now Jesus is comparing salvation, true religion with a war when the Christian is against the world. Now how do we count the cost when we don't know what the cost is? You don't know what's ahead in your life, I don't know what's ahead in my life. So Jesus comes right in and saying, any cost. You must come to me at all costs and at any cost. I am looking for the highest commitment. Now, I want to say that, that there is no payment for the grace of God. You cannot purchase salvation. You must come without money or without price. But then there's a cost. And I've been reading Spurgeon over the years, and I found this example, and I like it. A blind man is sitting at the side of the road begging and he asks for his eyes to be opened will it cost anything no the savior would not accept all the gold in the world for the cure he will freely open his eyes but when they are opened it will cost the blind man something obtaining his sight he will be called upon to discharge his duties as one who has eyes he will not any longer be allowed to sit there and beg or if he tries to do so, he will lose sympathy with which is bestowed upon blindness. Now his eyes are opened. He must use them and earn his own bread. It will cost him something, for he will now be conscious of the darkness of the night which he knew nothing before. Are there sad sights which now he must look upon, which never grieved him before? For often what the eyes do not see, the heart does not know. A man cannot gain a faculty except at some expense. He that increases knowledge or the means of gaining it increases both sorrow and duty. So says Jesus, likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I'm not going to make any comment to that. I don't feel qualified to. Maybe we need to talk about it. <laughs> Maybe we need to be like those, those old disciples and rabbis and sit and talk about these things. What does Jesus mean? Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's not much of an appetite these days for wrestling with the Word of God. We prefer nice, simple answers. Um, as I've said, discipleship is often the, core, uh, the, 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 the subject of a course with formulas and principles. Four principles of humility, you know, five principles of a holy life. But that's not the issue. The issue isn't principles, 
The issue is a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Will I willingly surrender and submit for my lifetime every aspect of my life? Personality, character, desires, motivations, family, anything else and everything else to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I know it's a solemn word, but I, I, I want to be this morning. I'm anxious that we don't bring people into a false place by giving them a few Bible verses and getting them to say the sinner's prayer. That we bring the truth to them as said and expressed by Jesus Christ. Our teacher, our rabbi, is Jesus himself. Hallelujah. And he promises this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, listen, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Lord, may we preach this gospel truthfully and may we take it on board truthfully. May we examine our hearts this morning. I want to examine my heart this morning. I want to recommit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his lordship. I want to surrender afresh, don't you? I want to surrender afresh this morning and say, yes, Lord. I don't want to be in light about these things. I don't want to go according to the culture often of the church as it is today. I praise God that there are men and women out there all over the world who are preaching a true gospel. I praise God for that. I hear young men sometimes on YouTube and I thank God my heart races. They're preaching a true gospel. They're not bound up in this nonsense that we're hearing so much of today. And may we be a church who speaks the truth even if it seems to be repellent to people. Wesley said, if you haven't upset someone today, to his preachers, go back to your job. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, people will be saved or upset. People will be saved or they'll be challenged and they will, they will not like us. Well, let's, let's take that risk, shall we? So we might speak the truth and see people genuinely saved, genuinely saved for his name's sake. Father, we come, Lord, with these verses on our lips. And we don't want to take them lightly. We don't want to skip over them, Lord. We don't want to dilute them water them down. We want to hear you saying those same words to us today. Want, Lord, to submit our lives to you again this morning. And say, Lord, if there's been a lack in any way, then we ask your forgiveness. And bow the knee this morning and hear Jesus himself speaking to us these solemn truths. Lord, we want to carry that cross, that peculiar cross that you have allocated to each of us in a different way, as it were. And move through our lives, Lord, carrying our cross, Lord, let there be no more selfishness, an end to sin. Lord, an end to trying to do things by our own efforts and a total commitment to you from now on, Lord. Lord, we don't want to be like that rash builder and that rash soldier, but to count the cost 
and to move ahead in these terrible days and difficult days. Build your church here, Lord. Build your church, Lord. Oh, Father, please bring those who are genuinely seeking you, Lord. Not swayed by miracles, not swayed by signs and wonders, though we pray for those too, Lord, that follow the word. Lord, but are looking to you alone. Teach us, Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray for Saturday night. We pray, Lord, that as people come here, it might be a great time of rejoicing. A great time of rejoicing, Lord. Lord, and, and, and in a sense, a, a new beginning. We pray for Slavic and Niku as they come and speak next Sunday and take the service, that you'll speak to us, Lord. We thank you for every nation represented, for every tongue. We love each other, Lord. We find we have this in common, that we love the Lord Jesus Christ, which seems, Lord, to, to be enough <laughs> for every relationship. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you thanks for every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and look forward to that day, Lord, when we shall all sing together. Oh, God, we shall all be with you, Lord, in glory. And we'll discover, Lord, that all we thought, it's much more. It's much greater. So, Lord, we pray your blessing on this church and upon ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen, Lord.